Let us pray. Move through us, O God, we ask by the power of your Spirit that your words might touch us into life, into love, into actions for peace and justice. Amen. Lives often starts in the same place. The processes may be different. But whether it's an invention that revolutionizes our daily lives or a social revolution that invents new ways of being together in justice and peace, it often starts with a single question. What if? What if? And so somebody has a dream about how life might be changed. What if? Or some people are frustrated with the way things are, or angry at the injustice they see, what if it was different? And from that courageous question flow as a whole series of events from which we are often the beneficiaries. And so it was in the latter part of the 1800s, some Christian women and men in the new country, the then new country of Canada, asked the question, what if? What if we could break down centuries of divisions between the churches? What if we could overcome all of those barriers that we erect and concentrate on those things which were just the things we share? What if we could create a new church in this new country of Canada to address the challenges that we are facing? The challenges of an expanding West, which in the late 1800s, early 1900s, was filling up with immigrants from Europe. The challenges of the East, where the the cities were industrializing and bringing along with that all manner of new social problems. What if? Well, who knows? Great church line. Nobody had done it before. Nowhere in the world had anybody tried to bring together churches that had hundreds of years of tradition of being separate. Most people said, can't be done. You can get them to work together for a time but you can't get them to join together. And so what happens? When we're faced with something like that, we're often caught in our fear. And fear closes in on us. But we can make a choice. We can face our fear. We can move on and find hope and climb out of our despair into hope And we can find the courage to walk down that road into action. We can take action now. But it's a choice. A choice that we have to make. Because if we don't make the choice, we'll stay trapped in that fear. And there was lots of reason to be afraid. How will I find my place in this new, bigger church? What if those people over there that we're joining don't have the same commitments or the same priorities that I have? What will happen? When I was serving the Uniting Church in Australia in 1999, their union was just in 1975. So there were enough of the former Methodist and Presbyterian and Congregationalists around that when somebody, something went wrong, There was always somebody to blame, those folk. Or what happens if in my town or my village, the churches get together and they decide to use a church building other than the one I've grown up in and love? Big questions. Big questions and no answers. And the vision was larger than the questions. The vision's not just of a made-in-Canada church, but also of a church fired by what is called the social gospel, 
the sense that when Jesus did those things that changed lives, when he told the stories about justice and he did the acts of freeing people, they weren't just one-offs. They were models for us of how God wants the world to be. That God is concerned not just with souls, but also with bodies and minds. That God is concerned not just with individuals, but also with communities. That God is not just concerned about a future we might call heaven, but with the here and the now. And so it was on the 10th of June in 1925 in the Mutual Street Arena in Toronto, the United Church of Canada was born. And here we are, 88 years later. What if? And you see, that's always the big question. When we face a choice, how will we respond to our fear? Will we move from fear to hope? And from hope through courage into action? Or we will, will we stay in our fear? What if? In the days of Elijah the prophet and also of Jesus of Nazareth, the place of women in the society was tenuous at best. And if a woman lost her male protector and provider, whether it was a husband or a father or a brother or a son, the results were often disastrous. Because in those days, people's circle of concern was for those who were in their immediate family. And if you didn't have anybody to support you, the result could often be misery and poverty and death. Now, we like, some of us like to think, well, the Bible's old and far away. And we have a, a much better social network, social underpinning. But you know, if you're in a single parent family led by a woman today in Canada, you have a much higher chance of living in poverty. And if you're an older woman living by herself in Canada, the chances that you are impoverished are statistically much higher. And employed women in Canada, employed women in Canada, earn a fraction of what men do. So, you know, maybe this Bible thing isn't quite so far away as we might like to think. Imagine the, the woman, and here's where we might miss a nuance in the Elijah story. Picture in your mind, if you would, that whole area that we call the Middle East, okay? Got it in your mind? There is a drought all across that area. Doesn't respect the borders of countries or nations. It's all across the area. There is a drought. And along with drought comes famine. And there are hungry and starving and desperate people all over the place. There are desperate people in Israel, including widows, and the Spirit of God sends Elijah to Zarephath in Sidon to a Gentile town, to a non-Jewish widow. God plays outside the lines that we construct. Now, try and put yourself in her sandals. Life's tough. Life's very difficult. You have enough food for one more meal for you and your family. And then after that meal, nothing stands between you and starvation. And this Jewish prophet, who you've never met before, comes up to you and asks you for a meal. Yeah. The normal response, the response of fear would be to say, look, there's enough food for two, but not for three. But something happened. She moved, she trusted and she moved from fear to hope to the courage to take action indeed by feeding this stranger 
and you heard how the story transpired. What if? The story of the widow in Nain is no less confusing. Jesus and his friends are coming into town as they meet the funeral procession. It's just like you were driving along Sackville Drive and you met a funeral procession headed to Oak Ridge. You don't know the person in the hearse. You don't know the family. But Jesus is there. And there's a widow. And not only is the there going to be a space at the table, but now she has to face the bill collectors without a provider or without a protector. And Jesus lifts up her son. We don't know why these places and these people and not others. And that's a good question. But it shouldn't stand in the way of our recognizing that these two men of God, when they saw the opportunity, chose to act. And that for Jesus, it was never enough to talk about the love of God in the future without deeds and actions right here, right now, today. Which raises the question, I guess, where do you find yourself in the story? There are pain-filled stories, but they have a happy ending. Where do you find yourself? Perhaps today you are the woman, those women, and your hopes and your dreams, they're lying there in front of you. And you feel like something precious has died. And you don't know how you're going to go on. And Jesus reaches out and says, stand up. Take up life again. Do you need to hear those words spoken to you. Because they are. They're being spoken this day to anyone here who needs to hear them. On the other hand, we know that Jesus didn't usually engage in one-offs. He was usually teaching his people what they might do or how they might be. So maybe it's you who need to be the one to give the hand that lifts up. Oh, I know, Jesus says, I know all about the excuses you have and the reasons you have. You don't want to get involved. You don't want to interfere. You don't want to impose. And Jesus says, I'm calling you. I'm inviting you to be the one who in word or in deed lifts somebody up. And that's the call of Christ's people. That's the call to which the United Church has always responded. And, you know, in 88 years, there's been a lot of changes in our country and in our world. And it's not the same as it once was. But then it never is. The good old days probably never were. You have to look at the whole span of history. You see, many of us came into the church during or just after the greatest bulge in church attendance that ever occurred any time in the world. All of a sudden, after the Second World War, during and after the Second World War, everybody seems to have wanted to have been part of the church. And they had big families. And we were building churches all over the place. You could build a church, and it would be almost impossible for that church to fail. Because everybody wanted to be part of the church. But you know what? The United Church of Canada, along with all the other mainline denominations, along with social groups and civic groups, stopped growing in 1966. We're sort of like a dinosaur. It takes a while for the message to get through. But those were great years to be the church, weren't they? Oh, it was so supportive and so good United Church kids like me could learn the Lord's Prayer in public school. And the Gideons could bring their little red-covered Psalms and Proverbs and New Testament and shove them in everybody's desk and they were welcome. 
And the government sustained something called the Lord's Day Act, which made sure that church was the only thing going on on Sunday. Great time to be the church. But our spiritual muscles got kind of flabby. And we forgot, if we ever knew, we forgot what it means to be Christ's people in a neutral or even a hostile time. And so when we look around today and see what is happening after 88 years, we might feel some fear. Yes, we might. I'll pay you after. <laughs> because there is plenty of bad news, isn't there? I guarantee you that within the next few years, hundreds of churches across the Maritimes will be reported as closing. I can guarantee you that. Part of it is because of social demographics. Villages and towns and communities which were once bustling are now virtually vacant and those churches cannot be maintained. Sometimes it means that those communities of faith are remissioning themselves. Sometimes they're going out of existence. But I can guarantee you that it will be reported as bad news. Today and every day, Canada grows more diverse. And I think that's a good thing but it means that there are less of us, Protestant Christians, in the mix. And that's going to be reported as bad news. I guarantee it. The good news is, the bad news isn't the whole story. The good news is that the bad news forgets the most crucial thing, that the foundation of the church has never been our numbers. It has never been our social prominence. It has never been those times when the moderator could call up the prime minister and get the telephone call answered. The foundation has always been the risen Christ, in good times and in bad. So that if things don't look just the way we want them to be, we need to look beyond that to the call of the risen Christ and ask, what if? What if? What if instead of bemoaning those people who aren't here, we resolve to celebrate everybody who is here? I know, it's a novel idea, but work with me on this. Instead of complaining about the respect we don't receive, we give thanks for the opportunities that we have to lift people up in the way that Christ calls us. What if instead of thinking that other people should do, we choose to do? And what if, when we are afraid, instead of giving in to our fear, we take hold of hope, which is the risen Christ. And we move into courage, believing that he is calling us, even when we don't know what the future looks like. And we dare to take action, action that is guided by the best of our faith and wisdom and knowledge. And we do those things we say those words and we are those people that Christ modeled for us. And who knows what might happen in 88 years. I can guarantee you something else. I'm giving you a lot of guarantees today. Uh, you can even come back and collect on this one. 88 years from now... <clears throat> 88 years from now, the church will be as different and unexpectedly so as it was for our grandparents in the faith who went into that arena in 1925, believing in the vision, believing in the call, 
Believing in Christ who is the foundation and the Spirit who is the motive power. And so it is for us. And so it is for us that those with ears hear the Spirit's word to the church. Amen. Let us, let us pray. We are often overwhelmed, O oh God, when the present and the future look so different from the past. Help us to know that for your people it has always been thus, and that our security lies not in knowing for sure what will happen, but knowing the one who holds all things. And so trusting in you, help us to go forth from this 88th birthday, looking with excitement and anticipation, with hope and with courage to all the good things to which you will call us. Amen.